that, man, we all just worship our God and King and put him first in everything we do. And today, we're starting a new message series entitled Foundations of the Faith. We're going to go over some of the core uh, thing, the core doctrines of the faith today and in the weeks ahead. And it's a great day to kick it off on Father's Day, pointing people towards our Father. And one of the spiritual fathers of this house is going to be bringing today's message. Would you give Pastor Don a warm journey church welcome? All right, brother. Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there today. How are you guys doing today? All right, all right, man. We're, we're live and kicking. Hey, hey, all you Father's Day dads out there, you know, I don't know if you guys ever thought about this, but have you ever noticed that Father's Day always seems to be a bit scaled down from Mother's Day? Anybody ever noticed that but me? You know, it's like I went to Walmart the other day, and usually at Walmart, you know, I went there about maybe about two weeks before Mother's Day, and like all the main aisle, dude, it was just like flooded with Mother's Day gifts. They have to add a whole nother section to the card, greeting card section, just to handle the volume of the Mother's Day cards, you know. And so the other day I went in there, in that area where they had all those Mother's Day gifts in there, they had like a Pennzoil motor oil display with a filter. And like that, in the card section, there's like a place this wide for Father's Day cards. And I looked at the oil display, I'm going like, what's that saying? You know, I'm not really sure, you know, what the sentiment is in that, you know. And it's funny, you know, Mother's Day, you know, you get bombarded with all the ads, you know, like they, Mother's Day, all the sales, all the cool stuff that they got out there, you know, you know, weekend package getaways, you know, spa day spas for mom. But on dads, man, it's not like that on Father's Day. In fact, Guys, th this is what the ads for us get. How about getting dad a fan? Look, dad likes fans. There, there's a fan, you got a fan today, dude. You're kicking down there. Or, or what about a two-step ladder, dad? <laughs> or my favorite, the uh, novelty doormat. That's just great, isn't it, man? Hey, dads, you know what? I don't know if we're ever going to match up to Mother's Day, but here's the deal. If you get home today and there's like a uh, jug of oil and a, and a filter and a card attached to it when you get home, you stand your ground, dude. Tell them that ain't going to cut it. Tell them to take you to Gators and get you some barbecue. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, today on Father's Day, man, we're going to look at our, our father today. We're going to talk, be talking about foundations, as Pastor Eric said. So uh, how many of you have been through the foundations class in the past? Raise your hands. Okay, great, like all 10 of you. That's wonderful. Hey, which that's good because that means that most of you haven't been through it. So you're here on a good day. So I want to encourage you guys to come for the next several weeks that we look at the creation, the fall, the rescue, and the restoration. And so, you know... What the foundations class does, it answers the question, what is the gospel? And so if I was to come down there and ask you guys the question, what is the gospel? Some of you looking pretty nervous. I'm really not going to go down there. It's okay. But if I was, if I was to ask you, what is the gospel? How would you explain that? What would you say to me? Would you say, well, the, the gospel is the good news? And, and yeah, that's the literal translation in the Word of God, sure. And maybe some of you say it's a good message. Or maybe you would talk about maybe it's the birth and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And all of those would be fine answers. But that's just my point today, guys. Shouldn't we as Christians have one common way to share the gospel so that everybody completely understands? Shouldn't we be all on the same page? You know, before I got saved... That was the question I had because I wasn't raised in church. I didn't know anything about the gospel. And the pastor that came over to share the gospel with me one night, he, he knocked on my, on my door and he came in and he goes, I understand you got a question. I go, yeah, I do. And, and so, man, he immediately, he could figure out, he was smart enough to know this guy doesn't know anything. So I'm just going to start with the beginning with him. And he took me through the Bible in such a simplistic way that he began to under, just explain to me the creation and then he moved right into the fall of man. And then he went right into the rescue of man from sin. And then he went into the one day restoration of not only our souls, but also one day God's going to restore all things back to the way that it was supposed to be. And here's the thing. It, it, you know, if that pastor would have looked at me at, when he came in my door and said, you know, I hear you got a question, you know. And, I, and, and if he would have looked at me and said, well, it's just the gospel, Donald. I would have looked at him and thought, 
<laughs> come on, dude, you're just going to have to give me a little bit more than that, you know, because I was born, raised, and educated on the west side of Jacksonville. So you're going to have to give me a little bit more than just the gospel. And man, he began to explain just such a simplistic way, and I'll never forget it. So I want to put this up on the screen for you, and this is what we're going to be going for the next several weeks. We're going to be looking at the creation the creation of all things, the fall of mankind into sin, the rescue of man from sin, and then the one day restoration that God's gonna restore all things to the way it should have been. And so those are the four parts of God's story. Remember that, the gospel as we know it, that's how we should explain it in the four segments of of the gospel there is actually the creation, the fall, the rescue, and the restoration. So it's the grand story of God, guys. That's what it is. And so to understand why it was written, let me give you the Bible in a nutshell, and I want to put this on the screen for you. You see, in Genesis chapter 1 through 2, we see the restoration or the creation of all things. And then in Genesis chapter 3, we begin to see the, you know, the fall of man into sin. Now remember this, the rest of the Bible, the whole entire rest of the Bible is all about the rescue of man from sin and then the one day creation of all things. So if we remember the Bible in that context, you know what? It's not so hard to understand it. And so our pastor, when we got together at the staff and we thought about, man, this summer will be a great time for all of us to go through foundations and get back to the fundamentals of our faith so that we can be grounded in knowing what we believe by faith. And so it's wonderful, wonderful to believe the gospel simply by a childlike faith. I mean, that's what's required in the salvation. But listen to me. We should know about what we say we believe by faith. Amen. We should know that. We should all be able to say that and tell that to someone. But sadly, many people who say that they're a Christian are unable to do so. For example, man, if I was to ask someone, let's say, for instance, like to maybe go up to an automobile, automobile mechanic and say, can you explain to me how to change my oil? Like the oil that I got on Father's Day. <laughs> and if he was to say, I don't know how to explain that to you. You, I wouldn't think he'd be much of a mechanic. I mean, would you? No, absolutely not. But sadly, so many people, so many Christians are unable to explain what they say they believe by faith. And that's why the taglines of the foundation class is know what you believe. And I don't say that to make any of you feel bad or ashamed of what you don't know. I say that, guys, to encourage you. I say that to lift you up and stir something up inside of you that says, I want to know God's story. I want to be able to explain the story of God. So the next several weeks, we're going to dive into these topics and we're going to look at the, uh, the day we're looking at the creation. Next week, we're going to look at the fall and the rescue and the restoration. So here we go. Are you guys ready? Let's go, man. The infinite grand story of God is actually happening all around us. And God's invitation is for us to join into it. So the story begins with God. He's always existed exactly how he is. And if the fact that he's always existed, that he's never had a beginning, it it kind of boggles your mind and that's hard to understand, we'll join the crowd because I feel the same way. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around it. But look at what Psalms 90 verse two says. It says, before the mountains, before the mountains, were brought forth for you had ever formed or given birth to the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting you are God. So the story has been going on long before you and I were ever on the planet and it's gonna be going on long after we're gone. So God is the central character of this story. And guess what, guys? He commands center stage in all creation and existence and redemption. So I'm not trying to put us down this morning and say that we don't matter as little people on the earth. In fact, guys, it's just the opposite. We actually have a part in his story. How many of you believe that this morning? We actually have a scene, a part in the story. Man, that's what I want you guys to see. Amazingly, we actually appear in his story. And call me crazy, but did you know we existed in his thoughts long before the creation of the world? 
You want me to prove it to you? I can chapter and verse it. Here we go. Look at Ephesians 1 through 4. It says, just as he chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be what? Holy and without blame before him in love. So we see there that God had us in mind long before the world ever came to be created. In other words, God knew you and he knew me ever before he even created dirt. How awesome is that, man? I just, I just, it's so hard for me to wrap my mind around it. I just, it's just the most amazing thing. And here's what I want you guys to understand this morning. And man, we've got to get this part straight. In fact, look to your neighbor and say, we got to get this straight. And here's what we got to get straight, guys. The, the story of God already has a star. And the star is not you. And it's definitely not me. And here's this why this matters so much that we get the story straight, guys. Because if we don't get the story straight, everything in our life is going to be out of sync. And we'll spend the rest of the days of our life hijacking the story of God. And we'll begin to turn it into us about the story of us, you know, our will versus God's will, our agenda versus God's agenda for our, our life, you know. And so we'll become completely oblivious as to why God created us. So when God created you and when God created me, he did so with a purpose in mind, which brings us to the next question that most people have. <laughs> What's my purpose? Why am I here? Has anybody ever wondered that? You guys ever wondered that? Huh? Anybody besides me ever wondered that? Why am I here? What's my purpose? I've had people ask me that during my time in the ministry so many times, but one time this person asked me that, and I will never, ever forget this as long as I live. You see, in 2007, I was actually hospitalized for internal bleeding, okay? And, and for whatever it's worth, guys, there's a warning on an ibuprofen or Advil and BC powders that says, and I quote, warning, stomach bleeding applies to you. For somehow I missed that, okay, and I wound up in the hospital. That little stunt right there cost me five days in the, in the hospital. And, and so while I was in there about the third or fourth day, this guy knocks on my door and he goes, Mr. Schott, he says, I, I've come to take you to have an electrocardiogram done. And I looked at that guy like a deer, you know, in the headlights, you know, and I thought, dude, I, I don't even know what that is, but if it'll get me out of this room for a little bit, I'm all in. Let's do it. Let's go, you know. So this guy wheels me into this uh, little room, and there was a young lady in there, and she began to hook up these electrodes to me, and uh, I guess she just thought she'd kind of be relaxing and a little bit more personable, and she began to ask me questions. She said, where are you from, Mr. Schott? And I said, well, I was, I'm from here, right here in Jacksonville. I was born and raised in Jacksonville. In fact, I was born in this very hospital. And I said, I've lived here all my life, you know? And, and so she began to, you know, we were just kind of chit chat back and forth. And, uh, you know, I just happened to just tell her that, that my wife and I, even though we've lived here all of our lives, we, we actually moved to Costa Rica for two years. And when I said that, man, her ears just kind of perked up and she looked, she go, wow, that's awesome. She goes, you don't mind me asking, why, what took you to Costa Rica? And I said, well, my wife and I are in the ministry and we just felt the call of God on our life to go and minister to the people in Northern Costa Rica. And, uh, you know, and I could tell by the look on her face that there was something up with her. And all of a sudden she looks at me, and she says, man, it's just awesome that you know your purpose in life. She goes, it's so weird. She said, because for the last several months, I've been asking myself, what, what was, why am I here? She said, she's beginning to think, is this it? Is this all that life, the life that's there? I mean, she said she had been to school for four years to learn how to do what she did. And all of a sudden she's starting to question that. She goes, I just want to know what my purpose is in life. I looked at her. I said, well, honey, I can tell you that. I said, you were created by God and for God. And I begin to uh, quote Isaiah 43, 7 to her, which says, everyone who is called by my name for who I have created for my glory, whom I have formed and made. And so I could tell when I told her that she didn't have a clue of what I was talking about. So I knew what to do, man. I just immediately went right on into the story of God. And I began to explain to her 
that, you know, it all started with God's creation and then something happened, terrible happened and, and men fall, fell into sin. But that was okay because one day God was gonna send the rescue through Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And I began to tell her about the restoration of all things and I did it in a very systematic but very concise and very short way. And I told her at the end of that, I said, listen, all you need to do when you get off work tonight, man, just get alone. So just get alone with God and just tell him that you're sorry. Just tell him that you understand that you're a sinner. I said, that's all you got to do is just ask him to come into your heart and forgive you of your sins. I said, if you really mean that with all of your heart, he'll do just that. He'll save you right then. And so I'd shared the gospel with us and, and the test was over and a guy came in and he kind of pulled me out of that room. And this is what I'll never forget, guys. You see, it was going down the hallway. It was probably about maybe, I don't know, 50 feet down the hall. And all of a sudden, I hear that same voice yelling behind me, Mr. Shot. And I said, and the guy stopped. And I said, yeah. And she goes, thank you. <laughs> no one has ever told me that before. Man, I'm going to tell you what. In that moment, I don't know what that guy thought that was taking me back to the room, but I, I just started, it, it got really emotional for me because I knew in that moment that God had me there for a time such as that, that he had a young lady in that hospital in a little tiny room deep embedded inside the hospital who needed to hear about the story of God. And God was gonna put me flat on my back so I could tell her. You see, that's why foundations is so important, guys that you know the story of God and that you know how to explain it because that's a huge part of our purpose to go and tell others about God's story. Hey, look what Matthew 28, 19 says. We've read this verse 10 million times in church and I wanna just look at the very first part of it really briefly. It's, it just says, go, therefore, <laughs> and make disciples. Hey, you know what that word therefore is therefore? <laughs> God is saying therefore because I created all things and therefore because I provided a way for that relationship to be restored back to me. Therefore because I am God and I created you for my glory. Therefore because of that, go. Go and tell. That's what that verse is all about, guys. I think we miss the simplicity of that verse. See, your job and your career, guys, it's not your purpose in life. It may factor into it in some facet. That might be your mission field. I don't know, but that's not your purpose in life. You were created by God for God. And this is why we have got to get the story straight, guys. Because if not, we're going to spend all of our days hijacking the story of God. And we're going to turn it into the story about us. So let's go to Genesis and let's help us understand more about who God really is, first of all. Look at Genesis 126. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. You see, in this one verse right there is the most important doctrine to our Christian faith. Did you know that? The very first sentence in the Bible Let's look at it. You see, when you focus in on those personal pronouns, us and our, who's us? This is in the beginning. Who's our? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, let, let's look at it. First, it's, it's just simply God is choosing to manifest himself in three distinct personalities. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They were right there in the beginning. They've always e existed. So the word Trinity, as we like to refer to it, you know, you're not going to find it in the Bible, okay? But the idea of the Trinity, in other words, uh, God being three distinct personalities is threaded throughout the word of God. And so it just simply means three parts being one. So let's look at God the Father first of all. So God the Father is the first person of the Trinity. He is the creator of all things. And I'm going to put the scriptural references. I guess they're not up there. Yes, they are up there. Hey, if you got a smartphone, take pictures. I'm going to be blowing through this. And we ain't going to have time to write, okay? But take pictures. Because I want you to go back and I want you to look these verses up for yourself. Do not take my word for it. So God is the absolute creator of all things. He is omnipotent. And that's a big kind of theological word. Most of you have probably heard that word before, but I bet... Not too many of you could actually explain it very well. So let's walk through it. Omnipotent, in other words, all power. Look at the first part of the word. It's omni. That's the Latin word for all. And the second word, if you cut off omni, we got what? Potent. 
Okay, potent means powerful. We had a chili cook-off one time, man, and uh, my man JD. JD, you here today? Yeah, there he is back there. That dude made some chili that was so potent it peeled the skin off my lips. That's powerful. Okay, it doesn't compare to God, but that, that's how you pronounce it. It's, it's omnipotent, and it just means all-powerful. Look, the second aspect of God, he is omniscient. Again, split the word up, omni, being all. Those, what, what word's left over? Science. It means, if you look up the definition of science, it means all-knowing, knowledge. So God is all-knowing. The third aspect about God is his omnipresence. I don't think we have to figure that one out, do we? I mean, it's pretty, that's pretty self-explanatory. But here's a great way to remember God's omnipresence. Most people describe it as God being everywhere at all times. I got a better way to think about that. Everything, everything is subject to God's presence. Not even the most common bird on the planet, which there are billions of, sparrows, not even one of them falls to the ground that escapes his presence. And so everything is subject to God. God the Father is the ruler of the universe. He is a sovereign in creation, providence, and redemption. Jesus, and let's look at God the Son. Let's look at his attributes. Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity. He possesses all the divine excellencies, and in these he's co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. So in the incarnation, in other words, God becoming man, he surrendered only the rights of his deity, but nothing of his divine essence. It's so important that we understand that. In his carnation, Jesus Christ accepted all the characteristics of humanity and so became the God-man. He was all God, but yet he was all man. And Jesus Christ accomplished our redemption through the shedding of his blood on the cross, his sacrificial death on the cross. His death was voluntary. It was substitutionary. In other words, he, sub he, he took our place on the cross. He was our substitute, and it was redemptive, okay? And so let's look at the God, the Holy Spirit, briefly. The Holy Spirit is a third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is a divine person. He's not a force. Okay? He's not a vapor, all right? But he's eternal. He possesses all of the same attributes of personality and deity, including intellect, emotion, he is omnipresent, he is omniscient, and he is omnipotent. In all the divine attributes, he is co-equal with the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is a supernatural and sovereign agent in regeneration. He baptizes all believers into the body. Such an awesome thing. Here's why here's what I love this part, man. The Holy Spirit indwells. He's inside of us. The one of the most greatest and most unbelievable things when Jesus left he said you're going to want me to leave guys because if I don't the Holy Spirit can't come but he indwells he sanctifies he instructs he empowers the believer for service and here's the awesome part he seals us until the day of redemption the Holy Spirit also administers the whole the spiritual gifts to us for the church for the purpose of redeeming the lost and building up the believers in faith not for the purpose of glorifying ourselves, but for the purpose of glorifying Jesus Christ. So apart from all that info that I just gave, good luck trying to figure God out, okay? Why am I telling you that? Well, because he's just so far beyond anything that we can ever figure out. So let's look at creation. Let's dive into creation real quick. And we're gonna start off with the single most important verse that I personally believe in the word of God. It's called Genesis 1.1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you're probably, well, why is that so important? <laughs> because everything about the Christian faith hinges on this one verse. You ever stop to think about that? So here's the deal. The Bible opens up with this grand story of God creating the heavens and the earth and, and everything in it. It all came about by his spoken word. He created it. He just spoke it. He created it out of nothing. There was no raw material. God didn't need that. God just spoke and it just happened. Okay? So just a spoken word. That's why Genesis 1-1 is so important. The fact that we are created is important to understand, guys, because it stresses that there is a creator. And it means that the creator is the source of life. 
So here's the deal, guys. The New Testament actually affirms Genesis 1-1. Look at it real quick. John 1, 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So who's the Word spoken of here in John? Who is it? It's Jesus. You got it. How can we know? Let's chapter and verse it and find out. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Look at John 14, 9. And Jesus said to him, he's speaking to Philip here. This is so funny to me. He goes, I've been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip. He goes, whoever has seen me has seen the father. He says, how can you say show us the father? Jesus said, dude, you're looking at him. I am the father. It's just so amazing to me. So Jesus was all God. And he became flesh and he dwelled among us. So far we have established that God is the creator, unmistakably, and that Jesus is clearly the word. Jesus is God. So here's the thing, guys. Satan has been covering up the fact that God is the creator for quite some time, very methodically, very slowly. And the reason why he has done that is so that he can keep people from hearing about the gospel. You see, the early days of America, when America was being formed, did you know that creationism was taught exclusively in our public school systems in the early days of America? And then by the time the 1800s rolls around, this bonehead named Charles Darwin comes on the scene and he publishes this, this, his report, you know, the theory of evolution around, around 1858. And so by the time the late to 1800s is rolling around, evolution was being introduced in our public school systems as an alternative to creationism. Now let's fast forward to 1960s. In the 1960s, evolution became law in most of the states in our country to teach evolution as an alternative to creationism. Little by little, creationism has vanished from the classroom. And the myth about evolution has become the fact. And the simple truth of God as the creator has become the myth in our public school systems. You, you teenagers need to be heads up. You guys need to listen to that. And so now we're witnessing generations after generations that know little or nothing at all about God and God being the creator. That's how slow and methodical he's been. And think about it now that, you know, prayer's been taken out of school long ago. Can't say anything about God. So why do you think that is, guys? Satan wants to suppress the truth about the gospel. And he knew that if I can suppress the truth about creation, then it'll give me a wide open door later on to suppress the truth about the gospel. And that's why Genesis 1-1 is so dadgum important, guys. It's huge. So let's look at creation. Are you guys ready? ready. All right, look to your neighbor and say, I'm ready. ready. All right, day one, we're going to blow through this. You might want to take pictures. Day one, God created the heavens and the earth and divided it from darkness, creating the 24-hour day, Genesis 1 through, uh, 1, 1 through 5. Day 2, God spoke and separated the waters from around the earth and from around the waters, or uh, separated from the earth from the waters around the earth, Genesis 1, 6 through 8. Day 3, God spoke. The waters on the earth were separated and dry land appears. Vegetation begins to grow according to Genesis 1, 11 through 13. Day 4, God spoke. The sun and the moon and the stars and the expanse of heaven to light the earth by day and by night. And so day five, God spoke. He created the creatures in the seas, the birds in the air, according to Genesis 1, 20 through 23. Day six, God spoke and created all land animals, insects, man, male and female. He created them, according to Genesis 1, 24 through 31. Day seven, God reflects on what he had created and it pleased him, according to Genesis 2, 1 through 2. So everything was created for a purpose, guys, including you and me. 
And so we're not some result of chance or not some amoeba, amoeba that's forming. And we certainly didn't evolve from a monkey's. Hey, ask a guy that believes in evolution. If he believes in, in you know, why are we not still evolving? Has anybody ever figured that one out? I just want to know the answer to that. Why? How come we're not still evolving if we evolve? But God created you and God created me to have a personal relationship with him. And suppose I was to ask you guys right now to characterize your relationship with God. How would you do that? Could you, could you do that this morning? I mean, would you say that God's like a friend that you occasionally meet for coffee? Or maybe he's like one of the Facebook friends that you accepted? Or, or is he at the opposite end of that spectrum? Would you say that God is a, is a very close member of your household who is included in every single aspect of your life and family? Most likely, guys, your relationship with God kind of falls somewhere in between those two scenarios today. But whatever state that your relationship with God is, be assured, guys, that he wants something so much more than what we're giving him. I can assure you of that. You see, God desires this connectivity that is so intimate that the word friend or fellowship just doesn't quite describe it. And of all the creatures on, on the earth that God created, human beings were his pride and joy. He created us guys like him. He created us in his image. Why? So we can think, we can reason, we can feel, we can make choices. And though all of those things we cannot in any way, shape, or form do as well as the Father can do, those attributes that separate people from the rest of creation equips us to relate to him in a way that nothing else can. Have you ever thought about that? You see, Jesus calls his followers friends in John 15, 15. That's not on the screen. You know, and Paul wrote about this. Paul wrote about that the believers are the sons of God in Galatians 4, 7. Those are not distant relationships, guys. They're not the impersonal Facebook relationship that you just chose to accept because you think they exist. Okay? You know, some believers have mistaken that doing something Christian, like coming to church and, and maybe going to a small group or, or, or maybe serving, some people have mistaken that that's the way to make God smile. But it's not. The way to make God smile is being Christian, having a relationship with God. Let me ask you this. Is God everything to you? Or is he like that distant friend again on Facebook? How would you characterize your relationship with God right now? I mean, what term would you use to describe that right now? Would you say that it's kind of like off again, on again? Or would you say that it's kind of distant? Maybe you would say it's just not that good, to be honest with you, Donald. And maybe some of you would be, well, it's, it's okay. You know, maybe if some of you would say, you'd say, well, it's good, it's good. And I've heard some people use the terminology from the Bible that they're either hot or warm or they're cold. And some people can't say that they're hot and they really can't say they're cold because, I mean, they do come to church occasionally and maybe pick up a Bible every now and then. They can't really say they're cold. So that must put you somewhere in the middle as being kind of warm. But that's not a good place. Actually, that was never acceptable to Jesus Christ. Look what Jesus says in Revelations 3, 15 and 16. He goes, I know your works. Remember, nothing escapes him. He says that you are neither cold nor hot. He goes, I wished you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That don't sound too good, does it? Warm's not good, guys. And then some people will describe their relationship with the Father as being on fire. <laughs> you ever heard anybody say that? I have. Uh, every now and then I'll hear somebody say, man, I'm on fire for God. And I'm going like, that kind of concerns me sometimes. Because what happens to all fires? You kind of burn out, you know, right? Yeah, they do. They really do. They burn out. And so I get a little concerned when I hear somebody characterize their relationship well, guys, and so here's what I'm saying, guys. I've said all that to say this. Why? 
Why don't we characterize our relationship with the Father and treat God like we would our closest family member or closest friend? Why don't we do that? I guess the biggest question is not so much why, but can you? Can you characterize your relationship with God right now as your closest friend, as your closest family member? Guys, that's what this message boils down to today. I hope you guys will think about that today. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. But Lord, you didn't need anything, God, but you desire more than anything the people that you created for a purpose to have that intimate relationship with you. So God, it is my prayer today that we will begin to take that seriously and understand just who we are, God. Would you help us, Lord? And for maybe for the person that's here this morning, maybe, maybe you're willing to be honest, man, I, I'm just going stray from God so far and I need God back in my life. And so maybe that you, would, you need to rededicate your life and before you even raise your hand, if that's you this morning, I want you to understand rededication is not frequently how many times you come to church. In other words, if you only come two, then how are you gonna come four? It's not that, guys. It's treating God as your closest family member, and even more so. That's rededication. So if that's you this morning, man, I just need to rededicate my life back to God. I need to take my serious relationship with God much more serious. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand? Anyone at all? Everybody, so everybody's got a really good relationship with God that's on. Okay, thank you for your honesty. Thank you, thank you, ma'am, I see that. And what about maybe you're here this morning that you just know that maybe you were like that girl just thinking, man, I want to know my purpose in life. And you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If that's this, you this morning, would you be so bold as to raise your hand this morning? Anybody here? Anybody want to receive Jesus? Father, thank you, God, for those who are honest enough to raise their hand, God. Lord, I pray you would empower them, God. I pray that you would equip them, God. I pray as a church family that we would rally behind all people here to help them to know the story of God and how awesome you are. Lord, would you help us to go and tell the story, Lord Jesus. Father, give us strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, guys, have an awesome Father's Day today.